public uh, information here, but we, we can provide that link to you uh, if you'd like to see the whole thing. So, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. I'll go ahead and start, and those that want to watch, watch a, a little bit more that we got on this. It's good stuff. This is also showing an Air Force C-5 tumbling out of the sky, yeah. and this, which I was absolutely like, wow. I, I'm sorry to tell you that what I see here in this statement is we don't rise to the level of expectations, we fall to the level of our training. That is absolutely true. If we have not been there before, if we haven't seen it before, if we haven't experienced it before, pretty much the only way we're going to survive is going to be one. Now, so it's going to take some work. It's going to take training. It's going to take some study. You know, there's another, uh, and this is you know, sometimes attributed to, uh, you know, to the uh, to the Navy as well, and the, and the Navy SEALs. There's another uh, quote also that this brings to mind as well, is the one that says that the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in combat. And so the point of this is, is that loss of control in flight is a very fatal threat. To be prepared for it, to mitigate it, not just in recovery, but awareness prevention is going to require you to do more study and more intervention than just what licensing training is taught. We need to do what we're doing now better. We need to get back into the books. We need to get up and get some training that's going to help us to be more effective in a crisis. Because it's not just small airplanes. ATR-72 uh, lost an engine, and due to the situation of startle, is the pilot reached up and actually closed the wrong throttle. Okay, brought it back, and then both engines were now with residual thrust, and the airplane, it wasn't a VMC rollover, the airplane actually stalled. And now there was a few people that survived that went into the water in that particular accident, but this is just not a small airplane thing. Loss of control applies to all level of your points. So think about your mental state. Think about how you would react in a situation with a matter of a couple seconds, you were put in a scenario where you had to take effective action. Would you pull here? In our experience, 75 to 90% of pilots who have never been here before will actually pull and make the situation worse. And by pulling, the nose is actually gonna go further into the ground, more increased in airspeed, more altitude loss, which is going to make it even more difficult to recover. And high altitude, other than perhaps getting to a restricted Mach number, which causes control issues, the ground impact is not imminent. But at low altitude, a mistake of just pulling, even for a second or two, can make all the difference between surviving and not. So our mental state makes all the difference. On the topic of mental state, we don't often think of our brain as a system. I just want to be very briefly talk about how our brain works. So we'll think of many of the systems of our airplanes with the fuel and electrics or the fly-by-wire system of the airplane, but probably the most important system, especially in loss of control and flight and upset prevention recovery training is the effectiveness of our brain. That scenario of where we get into a situation that we've never been before, we get the blood pressure goes up, our IQ goes down. What the body does in this situation is the following. When we get exposed to an event like I just showed you in the previous uh, situation, is that we have an emotional stimulus. Our body looks at that picture and has a reaction. And it's nearly instantaneous. It's called the startle response. And it's an emotional response. There's two pathways that that information goes through. There's a short route, which goes in our sensory thalamus to our amygdala and we get an initial reaction, just the general characteristics of the situation. And without training, for example, that's where pilots would immediately, inadvertently and unconsciously pull, which is the incorrect response to bury the nose. After thinking about it for a while, though, with a trained pilot or a pilot that can maybe think three-dimensionally, is a long route could analyze what the appropriate response is. So if you've never been there before in that situation and you're upside down and you pull and you don't know what to do, then your response might be, well, yeah, I'm panicked, you're pulling, that's the right thing to do. But with proper training, we can intervene with that. Now, here's the challenge. The starter response is uncontrollable, perhaps in about five milliseconds. In about 12 milliseconds, we interpret what we're looking at to take action in about 500 milliseconds for the longer thought process. The challenge with our brain going through this process is all of this happens below the subconscious. So that's how we fall to the level of our training. 
The only way we can affect this process is actually through training and condition, conditioning and habituation. Is that we have to be in scenarios, we have to have studied them, we have to understand them, we have to practice them with repetition to now change our responses in these scenarios. And it takes time. It takes a process and it requires training to do that. So academic knowledge and study is one thing. We absolutely have to do that. We have to do what we're doing now better but should we get into an event that is new to us, you are going to go with what you know because that's the only thing your body's going to do below the conscious level. All right? So that is motivation of why expanding your knowledge and skills to make this process more effective, in other words, for your automatic response to be the correct one instead of the counterintuitive wrong one, is a challenge. So we can influence this, and we can do this through training. So what does that look like? Again, this is the second video that I've used before. I'm inserting it here just because I couldn't find a better one. So the way this game works is that uh, what the, uh, the fellow here is doing is he's using his mouse to go around here to try to follow the track. And what's going to happen is he's going to, uh, going to see a screen and get surprised. And what we're going to see is we're going to see the startle response. We're going to see the amygdala fire and see what uh, the typical reaction of a human being is in a crisis unexpected. Okay. All right, so a bit of an exaggeration. Truth be told, that's actually a Saturday Night Live actor that did that, but it's just so powerful of representing what our initial panic response can be. So here's the bottom line. And the yerkes dodson model shows us, or the law shows us, that under increasing stress or pressure, our performance actually increases to the point where it gets to the point where it starts peeling off, starts getting worse, gets less effective. This peak and this combination is solely based on what our experience is and what we developed a skill at, all right? So where you peak, the challenge that you want to make sure happens is you don't want to have a situation with a required performance is higher than your ability to perform. And that's the uh, situation we face in scenarios that we have not seen before. Just not, not just upset training or loss control, pretty much anything in aviation is we want to be prepared, we want to be current, we want to be ready for it. Okay, so how does that apply to loss control? Well, that's the conditioning, and I'm gonna go through these relatively quickly, uh, simply because we're running out of time. But there's a process in training that requires a training of your brain and there's a process that it goes through that takes time to develop this ability of getting habituated. Sensitization is a challenge where we don't want to have a limited exposure to situations that would make our fear worse. And then what we want to do is have extinction, reappraisal, and ultimately overlearning. Now we are truly affecting that subconscious response to a situation where we're le learning new responses. So the bottom line, if you're trying to develop a skill set, is it takes time, it takes repetition, it takes clear understanding. And it really has to be in a scenario or an environment where your mental state is as close as it can be to what's going to be in the real world. Okay. So mitigation, uh, I'll plan on continuing here for about another 15 minutes, uh, Jason. I'll, I'll try to go through this without rushing too much. And, uh, and then we can wrap it up for questions. Does that work? That works perfect, AJ. Thanks. Okay. All right, great. All right, so for mitigation, uh, how do we mitigate this? So the one thing we have to ask ourselves is as human beings, how effective are we at managing risk? All right? Are we really thinking clearly all the time? Is it a natural state for us to manage risk? So what we need to consider is the fact that we are vulnerable, is that we are a human being, that we can make mistakes. And what I want to show you now is a crew of a C5 galaxy they got faced with a situation where a misbanage of an angle of attack, remember I talked about how the stall was a big threat, how the airplane got into a scenario where it took an entire crew to figure out what's going on. So this is the scariest video I've ever seen where everybody lives, so I'm just gonna go ahead and play it. It takes about two minutes, and I'll talk about what the indications are as it's playing here. But I wanna make sure you listen to the audio you may have to turn up your computer. The audio is a little bit low on this, but listen primarily to the female voice, which is the voice of reason in this scenario. Hard to see, airspeed, altitude, attitude. Here's the thrust on the engines, flap selection.
C5 galaxy. Unfortunately, it looks like it's not playing the audio. Let me just move this forward. Now I'm going to talk you through it. The airplane is now slowing down. Take a look at the airspeed on the left. It is decreasing. Power is back. Now the power is coming up on the right side. Now watch as the pitch attitude starts to climb here. And as they do that, the airspeed is going to start decreasing. Anybody who's flown a big airplane like this Anything below even 120 knots is really not a great place to be. See where the nose attitude is coming up? Watch the result on the airspeed on the left. The airplane is now going to enter in a scenario of dynamic instability. And you're going to see it behaving very much like you would expect a small airplane to behave. The point of this is, is that instability in stalled flight, going to an area where you've only been taught to get out of immediately and trying to stay there, is a very, very dangerous scenario. So here we go. Now just imagine now, this is a real airplane in a real situation, C5 Galaxy, with a big crew, and now they're in descent, on their way down. What's happening is the crew is pretty much yelling at each other, they don't know what's going on. We have the female co-pilot that's talking about push the nose down, push the nose down, you have room to maneuver. And eventually here, look at this, look at them coming down. They eventually get the airplane under control at about 700 feet above the ground and they get back and stabilized and recover. Okay, look at that. Look at that environment. It looks lower than 700 feet to me, but uh, the information I have that's 700 feet. Okay. So, they had a slat issue uh, in the airplane. They didn't get their stall warning. It was a, a distraction, mismanagement of angle of attack that led to that scenario. So the point is, military crew flying a big airplane with a team of people is that we are not invulnerable to getting ourselves into harm's way when it comes to loss of control in flight. Okay, what uh, I'm going to do here is, let's talk about the, very quickly, let's talk about the all attitude deficiencies. So what this chart represents is an airplane being 90 degrees nose up, 90 degrees nose down, 180 degrees of bank to the right and the left, and the airplane upset definition we talked about, which was 10 degrees nose low, 25 up, 45 degrees of bank, represents less than 5% of the all attitude environment. Now for us as pilots, is that that's where we spend the vast majority of our time, unless we're test pilots, field fighter pilots, aerobatic pilots, this is where our skill set remains. Now the good thing is, is that we have licensing training that takes us all the way up to 30 degrees nose up, 30 down and up to 60 degrees of bank. So the value of having an airplane upset definition is we need to recognize when we're exceeding parameters because there's a limited extent of our skill set. And that skill set and licensing is limited just over 10%, about 11% of the all attitude environment. The remaining nearly 90% is unaddressed in licensing training. Now that wouldn't be such a big deal if the skills we learned in the blue and the yellow areas actually were transferable into the red areas, but they aren't. They're counterintuitive. If we use skills here out in the red region, very often it's exactly the wrong thing to be doing to solve the situation. So, one little, yep. so one little tool here for us that I would like us to think about is if we think about that all attitude environment, think about those parameters of 45 degrees of bank, 25 nose up, 10 down, or at an inappropriate airspeed, is if we have that definition in our mind, and this is one of the interventions you can do today, is take those parameters or whatever parameters are appropriate to you and how you fly your airplane. If you see those, whether it's pitch, whether it's bank, whether it's speed, whether it's angle of attack, is you now realize that all of your focus needs to turn back to getting the airplane back under control. Stop what you were doing, get back to mitigating the situation, and if you don't know where to start, very often unloading or pushing is the first step that's needed. I don't have time to analyze this in great detail, but if we take a look at that all attitude environment, which is now 100% of it, we can see that less than 5% is where we spend most of our time. If we start looking at areas where the validity of the push is the first step is appropriate, we can see in those nose high, high bank situations, most nose low over bank situations, it's appropriate. 
And even in nose low situations, if we're there because of the stall, pushing has to be the first step, okay? Now, if we are nose low in a non-stalled condition, we definitely aren't going to be pushing. But if you were looking at an airplane upset, not knowing what you were going to face, and one step and the only step you can do to take the first effective action, very often that step is going to be pushing to reduce angle of attack and unload the airplane, okay? So on the left side, we can see our all attitude environment. We've talked about that in detail. On the right now is the stall upset that I had talked about previously as a number one threat. So what do we want to do as pilots is that we don't want to go all the way through to the stall before we recover, because beyond this can be a really ugly area, is that we want to recognize inadvertent slow flight as our intervention to the airplane upset. Because if we don't, it's going to escalate and it's only going to get worse. What this diagram is here is for people that aren't aware of that, it's called the VN or VG diagram. What it does is it plots G loading based on airspeed and it shows the lift limit of the particular wing that you're flying in. This is the stall line of the aircraft. This is the positive angle of attack. This is the negative angle of attack. This is zero G. And this is the 1G flight envelope that we are used to. Over here, we see a VMO airspeed. The maximum load limit on the airplane is up here. This is a normal category airplane at 3.8. And the negative load limit down here at minus 1.5. So the point of this diagram is that when I say unload the airplane, what unloading does not mean is it does not mean negative G. Unloading an airplane is reducing angle of attack for a light seat of the pants feeling to make sure that you're expanding the maneuverability envelope or decreasing the stall speed of the airplane. There is no real role of negative G in most situations in upset prevention and recovery training. So if you're going to use the push as your first step, number one, you have to know what you're doing. You typically need practical training to be able to do it. Pushing does not mean negative G. Pushing means reducing G to extend the safety margin of the airplane. So, Let's talk about this, for example, because there's what's called the uh, paradox in upset prevention and recovery training. And the paradox is an argument that apparently derives self-contradictory conclusions by valid deductions. All right, Even the name itself is a little contradictory. But I want to talk a little bit more about the stall here, because this is really important. One of the primary messages that I want to deliver to everybody today is if we are going to be able to mitigate the stall, in other words, if we can intervene and solve the stall, is we reduce our risk of loss of control by 50%. Now, the other challenge and where the paradox comes from is that very often you are going to hear that all we really need is prevention. If we can just prevent the stall, we are never going to need recovery technique. Well, here's the challenge of the, using the term prevention and recovery. So if we think about it, Slow flight recovery is stall prevention. And I'll submit to you that as a current aware pilot, if we get into inadvertent slow flight, that's where we want to stop the process because if we don't, it's only going to get worse. Approach to stall recovery is stall prevention. Stall recovery is incipient spin prevention. Incipient spin recovery is spin prevention. Spin recovery is hitting the ground prevention. So as you can see, the term prevention and recovery and how it's interpreted can really change how you think about the threat of the stall. Very often, we only think of the stall as somewhere down in here, in the developed stall area. I'm here to tell you that I would challenge you to try to intervene in inadvertent slow flight. The earlier in this process you can intervene, the more mentally aware you're going to be, the less skill that's going to be required to intervene, and in many airplanes, as we proceed down this area, as we start getting into non-single engine, normal category airplanes, your multi-engine airplane, for example, may not even be recoverable from an incipient spin or your business jet or whatever it might be. So your goal in stall mitigation and intervention is to never be there in the first place. So the paradox is simply a, is don't think about it in prevention and recovery. Think about it as intervening as early in the process as you possibly can. Okay, so the last area is risk assessment. So if we think about it, pilots, we're all well trained. We have in our airplanes, we have all these protection systems, stick shakers and pushers and audio warnings, even AOA gauges coming up soon, push the level buttons, fly-by-wire envelope protections, angle of attack indicators, yet despite all of this, loss of control is still happening. The question is that we have to answer is why. 
So what you need to ask yourself, are we still repeating the same mistakes over and over again as a pilot? This is an analysis of history looking at something that happened with the wagon and now we're starting to see with our big airplanes. My challenge to you is let's not make ourselves doing the same thing we've always done before and expecting a different result. Remember the intervention that is recommended by the experts from ICAO from around the world got together. How do we address those things that slip through our defenses, that slip through awareness prevention and we need to intervene? There's an established, vetted, well thought out, effective process that integrates the resources in the industry today to help us to be more effective. Go to the website, mbaa.org, LOCI. It's a great spot to go with all the resources you need to start making personal decisions on loss of control. And the last thing I'll leave you with is this is a circular process that ends with the threat. The threat hasn't gone away. Each of us, each and every day, need to be aware of it. Make decisions, intervene early in the process, because the longer we wait, the less capable we're going to be to have the discipline to intervene effectively. Loss of control is the number one threat we face. And I challenge you to go out and seek practical training because there's a fact, is that one cannot answer for his courage when he has never been in danger. If we are going to put ourselves into harm's way where we have never been before, again, honestly, what I have seen with the thousands and thousands of pilots that we have trained, you are simply not going to be able to figure it out. If you have never been before, never seen it, and it occurs to you, Pretty much the only way you're going to be successful in surviving is going to be by chance or luck. So in closing, please take advantage of the website uh, that the MBAA Safety Committee has put together for everybody. I think you're going to find it very interesting. Keep an eye on it as we move forward. We're going to be developing that more to put more resources in there. Remember, taking action is up to you. If you don't have the resources or the ability to go and seek practical training, at least start with educating yourself and going to some of the industry documents, even with the advisory circulars, and start reading about it. The GHASC, for example, has great resources and putting a lot of meat onto the training we're doing now, but doing it better. So please have a look at those resources. So, right at what looks like almost 9.15, Jason, I'm going to uh, wrap up and, and open it up for questions. I hope I didn't come across rushing at the end too much to devalue what I was discussing. Sure. Not at all, DJ. I mean, wow. <laughs> that was a lot.